Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis, a podcast dedicated to the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell case. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. And I'm Fruit Loop. So right out of the gate, we want to say thank you to everybody that has listened. We are, uh, we're almost what? How many listeners now? Uh, almost 20,000 downloads. What? That is crazy because when we started this, it was literally just, we had this brilliant idea to let everybody else essentially sit in on our conversations that we normally have about this case. And we honestly thought maybe we'd have three listeners, two of those being family or something. But uh, we're honored that you guys spend your time hanging out with us for a little bit. And I hope you're enjoying the way things are going so far. If you have any comments or suggestions, shoot them our way because we aim to please. That's right. Yeah, so there was a little bit of news uh, today. We haven't had very much come out as far as the tri- or the, the upcoming hearings or anything really new. But one little thing happened today. What what was going on? Uh, yes, yeah, so Detective, uh, we think it's Moffitt, was um, the lead investigator has changed. So there's now a, a new lead investigator on Charles. I think it's Charles's death, right? Yeah, I think it's the, the shooting death of Charles Vallow, which just passed the one-year anniversary, by the way. Yep. Yeah, so we are still diving into these custody documents. And I have to say, I get so stressed reading them. Yeah, it's it's a lot of information. It's a lot of nastiness, but it it's exhausting. I will say that the paper that is wasted on these documents that they read just continue to, you know, add to or it's the same thing and they just have to resubmit them. Oh man. Yeah, they a lot of times when there's a new um motion for like an adjustment for child support or really any kind of motion, um, a lot of times they'll attach the the visitation schedule or so it's a lot of we've learned now to, to be very selective in what we print out, mainly because uh, ink is like more expensive than liquid gold. Yes. And uh, so we're going to start just doing them on the computer and having those pulled up. But anyway, so we're going to jump right in. And we're, I think we left off the last episode where they were getting ready for their jury trial back in 2007. And so we're in the fall of 2007. This is in September. And if you guys remember, there was an issue with Vivian Lewis, who was, um, she was the one that was going to administer the psychosexual analysis on Joe. Well, she did, and he passed with flying colors, but she was sick. Yep. So... What we're looking at here is from September 12th of 2007. Um, at this point, the jury trial was set for September 24th. So this is 12 days away from that, uh, that hearing. And Joe Ryan petitions for a motion for continuance because it looks like Vivian Lewis is going to be removed. And they weren't sure if all the data that she had gathered doing Joseph's assessment would be available. So he had filed to delay the trial a little bit. He wasn't sure if Lori was going to go with it, um, but he agreed to go be reassessed by a new therapist only if he could have a continuance to get that analysis back. Because if you remember, he did good with the first one. Yeah. And I I think the difficulty was that the test required at least two two two-hour sessions and then had to be interpreted uh, so right. they were trying to get that done before trial. And you have to look too, this is very last minute. And I, I believe in, in the paperwork, Joe says, you know, I, I have to be out of town right before the trial for work. So I need to delay this trial so I can get this all in. And if you remember, he had the pending case for the allegations of sexual assault that were still sort of hanging over. Yep. So... 924 was when uh, September 24th was when the hearing was or the jury trial was originally scheduled. I think it got moved to a week later. We discussed on the last, last podcast how a lot of times just because you're on the docket doesn't mean your case is heard. So they had a slight delay, but essentially Joe Ryan decides that he's okay with them continuing the trial because it's brought up that 
the children are, are just want this to be over. The kids are anxious. And once they said that, Joe said, okay, that's fine. We'll just go full steam ahead. So the next thing that we are looking at is a document from October 26 of 2007. So the, the jury trial happened. And the results of that, we're not going to pick it apart. Essentially, Lori received full custody of Tylee. And there was a little bit, maybe two days difference where the grand jury decided not to bring charges against Joe Ryan. So Joe, what we're looking at here is testimony from that trial. And this is from Mary Fogel, who, as we know now, is the new guardian ad litem after Tom Ware was removed from this case. There's all kind of people removing and leaving. Oh my. And you know, this may be the kind of case where people just want off. Yeah. I, I mean, after a while, it's just, we, we were talking earlier, at what point, I don't even know that this can happen, but at what point can family court, like a judge, see what's going on and see that essentially Tylee's being used as a weapon against her dad and say enough's enough. I mean, you can come back if there are valid concerns, but these motions, sometimes there's multiple motions in a week. Yeah. It's just nonstop. Yeah. And the other thing I was thinking about earlier is with Colby, we don't know much about his biological dad other than a name, but it doesn't seem like she fought him for Colby. Now, if it's a situation where, where the, the parent doesn't necessarily want to be in his life. I was surprised though that we never heard anything about child support from him. Yeah, I don't I haven't seen anything on that. But I think the other thing to consider too is that she was much younger and so was he. So it, they may not have had the money to litigate like she did when she was married to Charles and they were able to take Joe back constantly. So we're going to jump into this document right here and um so Mary Fogel says that she testifies during the trial that she doesn't believe right now that she can recommend anything other than supervised visitation with Tylee and Joe Ryan based on the chem, uh, criminal case that's pending. And she doesn't have the psychosexual assessment. So what she says here is if Joe Ryan is exonerated in the criminal case and there's a reliable psychosexual assessment that rules out risk, that the visits would go to a standard visitation, which would be overnights that aren't supervised. It's kind of like Friday, every other weekend, every other, there's one day a week they throw in. And then you get into summers where the kids may go spend two or three weeks with a parent, the, the non-custodial parent. They're able to take them out of town, that sort of thing. So Mary Fogel was just hoping at some point, once all these issues with Joe Ryan were, were fixed or resolved, that maybe they could just settle into a very nice standard visitation schedule and everybody can move on, but I don't think it's going to be that simple. Yeah. And, you know, later on in her uh, testimony, she says that uh, it, she must have been asked a question about joint managing conservators. Uh, and she says, I don't think they are able to work as joint managing conservators, that she would recommend that the mother be managing conservator but with a requirement to be in counseling specifically to manage her anxiety in a way that doesn't affect the kids or the children. So I think that's, that's important. Yeah, it is. And, and these people, especially a guardian, because they work so closely with both parents and the kids, they know what's going on. Um, they are able to get things out of kids that normally they would clam up at. And I'm sure with all the combined therapy reports for Tylee and, and just seeing the volume of motions in this, in this case, I'm sure the guardian at this point was doing all she could, but it didn't seem like there was any kind of a victory for Tylee. Yeah. It seems like Lori would win one, Joe would win one, but Tylee never, you know, it's almost like she never got any relief. Yeah. You know, and in thinking, you know, back, to Joe agreeing to go forward with the with the hearing or whatever without that psychosexual analysis done, I don't know if that was a good idea. Um, 
you know, when you think about it, that's because this was a jury, right? Yeah. So they're, you know, they're in front of a jury. So in my mind, I would want that done so I can use that and say, you know, he passed this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not too sure that was a good idea. Yeah. So now we move to October 26, 2007. This is just a few weeks after the jury trial where Lori was awarded full custody of Tylee. And um, they're talking about the second test for Joe Ryan to take. And, and one interesting thing in this document, this document was from, uh, oh, it doesn't say. Let's well, see, this is actually from Joe Ryan's uh, attorney to the judge. Yeah. And it says here, what is interesting is that I have never heard a good reason why the Vivian Lewis analysis is no good other than the fact that it is pro-Joseph Ryan. He passed with flying colors and anti-Lori Vallow. She is a flight risk. She speaks to dead persons. She needs a thorough psychiatric and psychosexual evaluation. She should have supervised visitation, and Charles and Colby may tightly go to Miss Lewis's office. I'm not sure what that means. It seems a little confusing to read, but... Um, it says here that the guardian ad litem is not an expert to determine the validity of the test. And yeah. it says here, Lori Vallow testified that on the day she received the analysis, which was July 27th, she did not complain about the results. Her complaint was directed at the affidavit in which Miss Lewis was adamant she was a flight risk. Yeah, that's all she was concerned with. Yeah, so it goes to show you, though, her, her need to be seen as valid and... Um, the bigger person, I guess, even though it's obvious she's not, she's not even thinking at this point that that analysis could very well give Joe Ryan joint custody. She's yeah. just mad she was told she's a flight risk. Yeah, which she made the comments to the guardian at litem about she wouldn't let Tylee go with him and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. um, I mean, she made those statements herself. Right. And also, it seems like Miss Fogel did not allow him to retake the test, and it says that he is perplexed. Yeah. And, so. and maybe that was timing. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. I mean, they were very close to that trial date. He wanted the continuance. I don't think they granted it, um, or he agreed to just go ahead and get it over with. But yeah. I don't think he really anticipated that the um, pending charges would would prevent jurors from siding with him and actually on October 26th of 2007 so this is the same month that they had the trial the grand jury declined to return a true bill for indictment so they didn't feel there was enough evidence to go forward with charging Joe Ryan with the uh, molestation yeah like I don't you know you had Vivian Lewis's testimony then you have that and it's still you know, it's like they don't believe him. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's kind of the, the the scary thing is we we've always maintained we don't doubt Colby. Victims have a right to have their voice heard and their story told, but we're just reading from here what they're saying, and it just seems like, in spite of Joe being found as having no threat to children on these assessments, he's a low risk for for violence. He's a low risk as a previous offender. He's a low risk as a future offender. And still, the courts are not giving Tylee to her dad really any more than what he's seen her, which is not a lot. Yep. Just sad stuff. So we're going to move on to um, an interesting situation that we are trying to figure out. Yeah, and it's the wording that's just got us stumped a little bit. So what happens is Joe Ryan is going in for his second psychosexual evaluation. And it says, Dr. Thorne, who is the person administering the test, he recognized the name Joseph Ryan from his evaluation sessions with Miss Cheryl Wheeler, who is Charles Vallow's ex-wife. Yeah, and remember these cases were together, kind of, sort of, in the courts, I think. Yeah, they were kind of run in tandem. Yeah. Um, so you had some issues with Charles and Cheryl, and then you had this going on. So I, I can't imagine how much money they spent in legal fees that year. Oh, no. It, it, yeah, it, it had to be crazy. Yep. So there was a little bit of a concern that because this 
psychiatrist or I'm not sure of, of the title of this person, but maybe there was a conflict of interest there. And um, so what we don't understand is does Cheryl Wheeler know Joseph Ryan only because of the ex-spouse situation? And maybe they've communicated. Sometimes that happens. Ex-spouses get together and talk about the other spouses that they've divorced. And Or is it more? I don't. I haven't found anything out there that says it was more, but it sure reads like it could be. I'm, we're not starting rumors, but we are going to look into this. Yeah, because, I mean, it says um, that... This is coming from, this is actually coming from uh, Lori's attorney. And it says, we spoke about the situation and Miss and Miss Fogel reminded me about the emails that were re- produced by Cheryl Wheeler, evidencing coordination between Mr. Ryan and Miss Wheeler regarding their respective cases with Mr. and Mrs. Vallow. And then he goes into, after being reminded of the emails, and Miss Wheeler's testimony about her relationship with Mr. Ryan, I offered the opinion to Mary Fogel that I thought there was an ethical problem or at least a threat to internal validity with Dr. Thorne's continued involvement in this case. So that's the wording we're not we're not sure about is relationship. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't ever really heard anything about there being anything other than just the ex-spouse connection, but... Yeah, I mean, they both had evidence that would help each other, so... Yeah, I'm sure that's probably the case. So we jump ahead to December 23rd, 2007. And this document um, is it's a, from Steve, Stephen Thorne, a clinical and forensic psychologist in Texas. And um, he was the one that, that performed the second psychosexual evaluation of, of Joe Ryan. And... So it says here, in the end, as far as child protection services, and I assume law enforcement, um, there have been sexual abuse allegations naming Mr. Ryan as the perpetrator by Ms. Ryan's step, um, Mr. Ryan's stepson and Ms. Vallow's biological son. The case was closed and identified as unable to determine by child protective services. And it goes on to say the allegations involving, involving Tylee Ryan were reported by the mother Lori Vallow naming Joe Ryan as the perpetrator was closed out as ruled out by Child Protective Services. So that's another, he passed again. Right. And not only that, but after, uh, you know, you you think you have investigators, you have Child Protective Services. They all agree. And then you have a grand jury who says, we don't see any, any evidence of sexual abuse. So they all agreed that to them it was either undetermined or just ruled out altogether. So then you go back to what Tylee had to endure, which is medical examinations that were not pleasant at five years old, I'm sure. And um, and in the end, you know, Joe's name was, was pretty much cleared at this time. And... It's it's just one of those situations where it seems like she just accuses everybody of something really, really bad to get them out of her life. Yep. And, you know, looking back, uh, Annie, in, in one of Annie's interviews, she stated that uh, Tylee had to get to know you before she would open up. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure all of this yeah. leads, you know, it, it you you are that way if you've had to be protective and right. you've been through what she's been through. Yeah. And I, that's a whole rabbit hole to go down. Like the, the psychology of children who were in the middle of bitter custody disputes for several years where there are allegations of sexual misconduct by a parent. I mean, because it's not just like the allegations were made and then Tylee had no consequence to that. She had a ton of consequences. Yep. You have supervised visitation. You have, going to meet with tons of therapists when Lori would take her there's I mean all through these documents there are plenty of times where they reference that Lori just wouldn't bring her yep so it's kind of interesting if if you find out your kid potentially was was touched or abused inappropriately or sexually yeah you would have your kid at every appointment 
And sometimes it's just like she couldn't be bothered to take her. But I think that goes along with everything we've learned about Tylee and her mom. Oh, most definitely. So they go on to say that there's no reason to believe or any indication that anything has or will happen with Tylee. And there's no information that visits with her father need to be stopped. So I'm just confused. Why is he still having to fight so hard? Yeah. And then like our next set of documents is where we get into a motion for a new trial. And this is a motion brought by Joseph Ryan. Um, And on November 28th, after an early October 2007 jury trial, uh, the court signed an order in suit affecting the parent-child relationship, which includes, among other things, orders for the conservatorship, which we know Lori got, uh, in support of Tylee, the child of the parties. So at the conclusion of the trial, the jury found that Lori Vallow, Tylee's mother, should be appointed Tylee's sole managing conservator and this court so ordered. Um, So then we see there's a good cause exists for this court to grant a new trial in the present case. Uh, And I think you have some stuff where uh, there's some comments from the jurors and stuff. Yeah, so Joe is essentially, like you said, he's wanting a new trial because at this point, I think it was actually two days before the trial, the grand jury had failed to indict him, but that wasn't made available to Joe until after the jury trial where he essentially lost custody of her. Yeah. And then he had the psychosexual evaluation that was in his favor that unfortunately wasn't available because of Miss Lewis's illness. So this, it's just bad luck in this instance here he had his ducks in a row things just didn't get to him yep so what is interesting to me is that the jurors in the first jury trial in 2007 I'm assuming that maybe Joe Ryan's attorney reached out to them and several of them made statements to the court that had they known that Joe Ryan would not have been indicted, they would not have given Lori custody. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's shocking. Not not shocking in a bad way. Like, I'm like, what? Yeah, I mean, I understand if that's brought up, that the jurors have to consider that there is a possibility. Now, sometimes they'll ask the court, hey, it's pending, we shouldn't bring it up. Sometimes that's granted, sometimes it's denied. But... It put him at an unfair advantage because literally when they're trying the case, he's already been, you know, deemed that this was not credible enough to take the trial. They just did not have the paperwork submitted yet. Yeah. So, I mean, that changes the whole ball game. It really does. And you would think that that the, the judge would, you know, grant that new trial based on the new evidence. But Lori responds back and says, well, that's not really n- new evidence. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, that's huge evidence. Right. But I think uh, initially the judge denied the chance to, to have the trial done over. Wow. Yeah. So I have the statement here by the juror. It said, had I known the criminal charges pending in Hayes County were declined prosecution October 10th, 2007, I would not have voted to appoint Ms. Vallow managing conservator of the child. It was my belief and it was the belief of many jurors that the possibility of Tylee being taken away from Mr. Ryan because of a subsequent prosecution was not in Tylee's best interest. I decided that leaving her with Ms. Vallow until the Hayes County charges were settled, no matter no matter what I felt about her parenting skills, was in Tylee's best interest. So it makes sense if you're a juror, you hear daddy may be facing criminal charges for sexually abusing her. So I, you err on the side of caution because you don't want to be that juror that sends a child into a really bad situation and, and, and turn on the TV one day and boom. Now that probably happened and they felt the opposite because we know now Lori had something to do with her death. Yeah, and I understand them wanting to go ahead with it because Tylee's being drugged through all this stuff. But it seems to me the judge would say, no, wait. This is a major part of this case. Let's get this evaluation done and then come back. 
Yeah, and I, I feel bad because I'm sure Joseph probably, for the sake of Tylee, wanted to get this out of the way. And he did request the continuance, but ultimately agreed to go ahead and let, let it go on. Yeah. And it was unfortunate. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the only other thing that really happened in 2007, because at this point we're getting towards the end of the year, is that Joseph Ryan got a new attorney. It was Mr. Weeks. And apparently Lori had, um, I don't know if she had retained this lawyer in the very beginning of this case, but she had had some contact. The lawyer had looked over some stuff. He had been paid. So they filed a motion to not allow Joseph to retain this particular lawyer. I haven't found anything just yet that says he um, had to leave the case, but we do have paperwork here from February 14th. Of, it's Valentine's Day. 2008 and Mr. Weeks is the attorney. So I assume they agreed it would be okay. Just weird. And I know these are probably small towns, I guess. I don't I don't know, but that's that's weird. Right. So this is uh, a report to the court and this is from Mary Fogel the Guardian. And we're just going to read a little bit from these documents because there's so much that's relevant to this case, we're just pretty much going to read the new document. Yeah, so it, she says, I'm extremely concerned about the safety and emotional stability of Tylee. Uh, my efforts to intervene in this matter have been ineffective, and we know what kind of things, like, she just, I mean, this case in itself is just crazy, but uh, with her trying to be, you know, the guardian at litem and all that stuff, um, so she says in September 2007, I requested that the court stop visits with Tylee and her father in an effort to shelter her from the excessive tension that the adults were experiencing. At that time, the final hearing had been postponed and the therapist observations, along with Dr. Poole's report, indicated a high level of repressed anxiety in the child. At that time, visits were also being conducted with a bodyguard or off-duty police officer due to violence in the past. My naive belief was that people would settle down and work with a final order after they had an opportunity to present their case in its entirety. And the judge ruled on a final order. So she thought Tylee would be in a less stressful situation after the case had been resolved and the concern about potential violence would diminish. Mm. So, basically, until this is done, can we stop visitation until this is finished? Yeah, and I don't know that that was exactly fair, um, because at this point, this is February 2008. So, September of 2007, this is around the time that uh, it was time for the jury trial. So, what she had hoped was maybe, I guess, for a few weeks until they could get that jury trial in and get the order into the court. She not see her dad, but... It just seems like it's punishing Joe because Lori's acting a fool. Yes. And we know in this document it talks about uh, Lori moving to Arizona, had made visitation, you know, burdensome, involving frequent flights and travel. Uh, it just wasn't. It wasn't a team effort no. that had her best interest at heart. It says here that since the final order was rendered on January 11th, 2008, circumstances have not improved but have deteriorated. So in the first paragraph, she thinks, okay, once we get this jury trial over, there's an order, maybe everybody will be happy. But we're at February 14th, so for over a month, she sees it hasn't solved anything, it hasn't lessened the nastiness going on, it's its gotten worse. Yeah, and this is, I mean, it would require Lori to fly with Tylee for four consecutive Saturdays and then first, third, and fifth Saturdays to participate in her own therapy with Dr. Laredo and take Tylee to see Miss Smith. Uh, Tylee would also then be visiting with her father during that time. So that move was just... Uh, I mean, it was, that's horrible. I think the move was calculated to where at this point they've been fighting in court for two, six years. Yeah. It's 
constant 24-7 stress. You think about this stuff every waking minute when you're in the thick of it. It's expensive. It's just everything. So I think that Lori probably thought since the jury gave her full custody, she could just move and maybe Joe would give up. Yeah. Maybe he wouldn't take her back to court every weekend she didn't show. But how sad for Tylee that her life was just back and forth from Arizona to Texas to see her dad when really the court said she shouldn't have moved in the first place. She wasn't allowed to move, I don't believe. Yeah, I think it was uh, it, she had to stay with in Texas a hundred so many miles of Joe. And we know this move was further than that. Right. Uh, what sticks out in this paperwork, too, to me is it says that she has grown accustomed to adults who are highly upset and accustomed to police officers and bodyguards at the age of five. And we talked about on the day Charles was shot how how she was around those officers. Mm-hmm. I've always thought that. Yeah. She, I mean, she... It's, you know, it's nothing new for her, no. it, it, you know, because you, you would think with everything that had happened, and I'm sure she was in some sort of shock, and we don't know what Lori and Alex told her about what to say to the police. I, you know, we don't know if they threatened her. We have no clue. But the fact that she just stood there with her arms crossed, she's done this many times in her life, and here's the thing. Her mom has never been held accountable at this point, up to this point, so she probably thought, well, the cops will leave, Mom will, mom will be fine. Yep. And because that's what's happened up until this point in her life, which unfortunately was just a few months before she died. Yep. So it, it's almost like nobody saved her. Yeah. And then we see her, her, her ask. She wants to respectfully ask the court to appoint Tylee an attorney at Lightham. Yeah, and that's that's kind of a last resort. That's when a guardian has tried everything they were taught, everything they've learned doing this job for however long they've done it, and nothing is getting worse. Yeah. There are some cases where, you know, you, you have parents, for the most part, parents are scared of guardians because they have the power to strip you of your parental rights. So you when, would think when you deal with a guardian, you want to be on your best behavior. You want to stick to that court order because when a guardian's involved, she can get you into court a lot faster for bad things than you could think. And yeah. you're looking at contempt charges. You're looking at possible jail time if you don't abide by these orders. But, I mean, like everything else seemingly in her life, Lori just sort of said, well, I'll do what I want. You know, you got to prove what, what I've done wrong and this is what's best for Tylee. It, it was what was best for her. Yes. But... um we say this in every episode, but it's so true. Every episode, we just see another example of how Tylee was failed from a very young age up until she died. Yep. And it's like people tried, like that guardian at Lottom, she tried. Vivian Lewis tried. Yeah. But it's just like Lori always like slips through the cracks. Yeah. And here she says, my best efforts have failed and I'm unable to affect this situation in a positive way for Tylee. And there may be need for legal action that's not in line with either parent's contention of what's best for the child. So in other words, she's saying at this point, they're so embroiled with their personal battle that they can't see what's best for Tylee. Yeah. Although I do disagree. I think Joe had a much better idea of what was best for her. I don't think Lori had a clue yeah. what was best for Tylee. But, I mean, at this point, the Guardian has said, I, I, I can't think of anything else to do. Yeah. It, it takes a lot for a guardian to, to get to that point, I might add. Yep. So she just feels like this situation's never going to resolve unless there is a very strong legal advocate for Tylee. Exactly. Uh, I, I, <laughs> these documents, I'm telling you. Oh, my it's, goodness. It's just back and forth, back and forth. And uh, obviously, the the kids are the ones who get hurt. Well, yeah, I mean, it just seems like Tylee and Colby both kind of got drug along with her or by her to every situation. Just, you know, she, she marries Joe Ryan, they divorce, she's got no use for him. Let's accuse him of sexual assault. Now, we're not saying that, that he didn't do it. We're just going by what the papers say. But And then Charles, she marries him, 
They go through years together. They move to Hawaii. They do these custody battles, his divorce, and then she meets Chad. No use for Charles. He's dead. Yeah. Uh, she just throws people out like trash, yeah. including her kids. Yeah. I think her kids were meal tickets. Yeah. Yeah. So I not I think that's all uh, the documents and stuff we had to talk about today, right? Uh, well, pretty much, yeah. We're. I think we're gonna try to finish this up in maybe two more episodes. It. It's just we're saving you guys from having to read it, right? right? And I know sometimes it seems like we're repetitive, but it's sort of just. I think it's important to remind you guys of of the pettiness, especially on Lori's side. Um, where she wants to be the, the full custodian, but yet she doesn't want to take her to therapy. She doesn't want to do this. You know, she's taking her to the doctor when we don't think she was really sick. So she, she wants the title. She just doesn't want the responsibility of being a sole custodian. Yeah. It's insane. But um, we'll keep you guys updated if anything new happens. We're going to keep diving into these documents in the coming days. Hopefully we'll finish them up, I think, by the end of this week. And... Um, and at the same time, this was going on. I mean, you've got Charles and Cheryl in court about his family. Yeah. Can you imagine the stress in that house? There probably wasn't a time where it was just carefree. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. But people like Lori, I think, thrive on drama. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think it was Cheryl that said that she. it seemed like she enjoyed uh, being in the middle of that whole mess. Yeah, well... Yeah. She made it miserable for everybody, but that's yeah. all we have. If you guys have any questions, any topics you want us to cover, you can hit us on Twitter, Pretty Lies Alibi. We're on Facebook, Pretty Lies and Alibis. We're also on iHeartRadio now. They picked us up this week. Pretty exciting stuff. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, SoundCloud. That's the platforms we're on right now, and uh, we hope you guys have a great night. Good night.